Good evening. How are you? My name is Alice Hutchinson, and I'm the owner of Bird's Books, an independent bookstore in Bethel, Connecticut. This evening, I'm honored to be the new host of Right America. The aim of this series is to help the country back on a correct, productive course of freedom, justice, equality, and plain human kindness. Right America is a literary series spearheaded by author Roger Rosenblatt, featuring award-winning, nationally renowned authors, new and emerging writers, in readings and conversation each week about how books and art might bridge the deep division of our nation. Roger Rosenblatt, the esteemed writer and creator of Write America, put it this way, writing makes justice desirable, evil intelligible, grief endurable, and love possible. So welcome and please join us every Monday evening at this time as many of the most beloved and distinguished writers in the country read from their works and talk to each other and with you in an effort to bring us all together. Tonight, Bird's Books relaunches Write America with a reading by and conversation with Linda Paston, Tennessee Reed, and Franklin Jella. I will return afterwards to bring your questions and comments to the author. Just note, we're having a little bit of a technical problem with Franklin Jell's sound, but we hope to get it resolved by the time he comes up. And so some technical issues that you may not be aware of with Crowdcast. Obviously, you've discovered the chat to your right. Please keep the conversation going throughout the evening. It's so much fun to see your comments. At the bottom, however, you will see, ask a question. That's where you type your question. And in the last... 10 to 15 minutes of the evening, we will go to your questions and get as many as we can answered from the authors. The third thing is there is a call to action button at the bottom that says buy from Bird's Books. And so we are asking you to buy a book if you like the author's um, uh, books and support Bird's Books. Without further ado, I'm going to bring Linda on Linda Paston on and good evening, Linda. Hello. Um, I'd like to introduce Linda. Linda, among her many awards and honors, includes a Pushcart Prize, the D. Castagnola Award, the Bess Hoken Prize, the Maurice English Award, the Charity Randall Citation and the 2003 Ruth Lilly Poetry Prize. She's the recipient of Radcliffe College Distinguished Alumni Award from 1991 to 1995. She served as the Poet Laureate of Maryland and was among the staff of the Breadloaf Writers Conference for 20 years. Two of her books of poetry were finalists for the National Book Award. Linda Paston lives in Chevy Chase, Maryland. And I'll hand it off to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Alice, for taking on <laughs> this big job and Roger for having me back again. Um, I know that a lot of people listening in now are poets themselves or have studied poetry. And so the first poem I'm going to read is for them. Prosody 101. When they taught me that what mattered most was not the strict iambic line goose-stepping over the page, but the variations in that line and the tension produced on the ear by the surprise of difference, I understood, yet didn't understand exactly until just now, years later in spring, with the trees already lacy and camellias blousy with middle age, I looked out and saw what a cold front had done to the garden, sweeping in like common language unexpected in the sensuous extravagance of a Maryland spring. There was a dark edge around each flower as if it had been outlined in ink instead of frost and the tension I felt between the expected and actual was like that time I came to you ready to say goodbye for good for you had been a cold front yourself lately. And as I walked in, you laughed and lifted me up in your arms as if I too were lacy with spring instead of middle-aged like the camellias. And I thought, so this is poetry. Um, I am gonna become a great grandmother next month. 
So I've been thinking a lot about babies and delivering babies. And I'm gonna read a very early poem called Notes from the Delivery Room. Strapped down, victim in an old comic book. I have been here before this place where pain winces off the walls like too bright light. Bear down, a doctor says, foreman to sweating laborer. But this work, this forcing of one life from another is something that I signed for at a moment when I would have signed anything. Babies should grow in fields, common as beets or turnips. They should be picked and held, root end up, soil spilling from between their toes, and how much easier it would be later returning them to earth. Bear up, bear down, the audience grows restive, and I'm a new magician who can't produce the rabbit from my swollen hat. She's crowning, someone says, but there is no one royal here, just me, quite barefoot, greeting my barefoot child. <clears throat> This next poem is called The Cossacks and it's dedicated to Francis Smythe who died much too young. The Cossacks. For Jews, the Cossacks are always coming. Therefore, I think the sunspot on my arm is melanoma. Therefore, I celebrate New Year's Eve by counting my annual dead. My mother, when she was dying, spoke to her visitors of books and travel, displaying serenity as a form of manners, though I could tell the difference. But when I watched you planning for a life you knew you'd never have, I couldn't explain your genuine smile in the face of disaster. Was it denial laced with acceptance? Or was it generations of being English, Bronte's Lucy in Villette, living as if no fire raged beneath her dun-colored dress? I want to live the way you did, preparing for next year's famine with wine and music as if it were a 10-course banquet. But listen, those are hoofbeats on the frosty autumn air. <clears throat> and this is after minor surgery. This is the dress rehearsal when the body, like a constant lover, flirts for the first time with faithlessness. When the body, like a passenger on a long journey, hears the conductor call out the name of the first stop when the body in all its fear and cunning makes promises to me it knows it cannot keep. I know I'm not the only person that gets depressed every morning when reading the newspaper, um, more so every day. This poem is more or less about those mornings. It's called A Rainy Country. And I started with um, a quote from Baudelaire, which I will give you in English because my French is abominable. I am like the king of a rainy country. In the poem, A Rainy Country. The headlines and feature stories alike leave blood all over the breakfast table the wounding of the world mingling with smells of bacon and bread. Small pains are merely anterooms for larger and every shadow has a brother just waiting. Even grace is sullied by ancient angers. I must remember it has always been like this. Those Trojan women learning their fates the sharpness of the guillotine, a filigree of cruelty adorns every culture. 
I thumbed through the pages of my life, longing for childhood whose failures were merely personal for all the stations of love I passed through. Shadows and the shadow of shadows. I'm like the queen of a rainy country, powerless and grown old. Another morning with its quaint obligations. Newspaper, bacon grease, rattle of dishes and bones. Let's see, um, I'm gonna end with um, a poem, a family poem. Um, it's in a, it's a pantoum, which is a Malaysian form that's based on the repetition of lines from stanza to stanza, so that each line in the poem um, gets gets repeated. So you'll hear every line twice, and it's in a very specific order. But you don't have to know that. And it is my last poem here. Something about the trees. I remember what my father told me. There is an age when you are most yourself. He was just past 50 then. Was it something about the trees that made him speak? There is an age when you are most yourself. I know more now than I did once. Was it something about the trees that made him speak? Only a single leaf had turned so far. I used to know more now than I did once. Excuse me, I know more now than I did once. I used to think he'd always be the surgeon. Only a single leaf had turned so far. Even his body kept its secrets. I used to think he'd always be the surgeon. My mother was the perfect surgeon's wife. Even his body kept its secrets. I thought they both would live forever. My mother was the perfect surgeon's wife. I still can see her face at 30. I thought they both would live forever. I thought I'd always be their child. I still can see her face at 30. When will I be most myself? I thought I'd always be their child. In my sleep, it's never winter. When will I be most myself? I remember what my father told me. In my sleep, it's never winter. He was just past 50 then. Thank you. Linda, thank you. Um, I, I just want to say that I have read Insomnia and I loved it. I just think it's so spectacular. What a gift. Um, we'll, we'll catch up with you in a little bit. Okay. Next, I'd like to introduce our next author is Tennessee Reed, a graduate of UC Berkeley and Mills College, where she received her MFA in, creating, in creative writing. Excuse me. Tennessee is the author of the collection Circus in the Sky, Electric Chocolate, and Airborne. Her most recent, Calafia. Bur Calafia Burning, Poems 2012 to 2019, was recently published in November of 2020. She has presented readings of her work internationally and throughout the United States. Tennessee Reed is the managing editor of Conk Magazine and the chairperson of Penn Oakland, a service organization for writers and publishers. And I'd like to welcome Tennessee to the screen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So happy to have you here. I want to thank Roger Rosenblatt, Alice Hutchinson, Lauren Lundman Getty, and Lindsay Atkins for setting up this event. I will first read a couple of poems from my most recently posed poetry collection, Calafee of Burning. This is about the drought in California like an old friend whom you had given up for dead, rain returns to Oakland. The sun rises over the Oakland hills. The sky's hues of pink and yellow, orange, gold, and blue. 
scattered clouds linger from storms. The blues note bird sings his song, CC A flat. His voice stands out amongst the other chirping birds. Crows call from telephone wires and from trees on the adjacent street. Canadian geese honk as they fly over the house towards Lake Merritt. People honk their horns as if to answer. Neighbors rush out of their house for work and school. They climb into cars and on buses and squeeze onto BART. The noises of cars, buses, and BART on Market Street and MLK can be heard from my bedroom window. Garbage trucks shake the house each Thursday before the sun comes up. The neighbor's border collie Australian shepherd mix barks as a dog walker picks her up. Fat calico cats and black cats guard leftover Halloween pumpkins on the porch of the duplex across the street. GQ, the tuxedo cat, and Francis, the tabby cat, show up for their favorite photography sessions in their favorite spot on the stone steps underneath the apple tree. The wind howls, whistles, and shakes windows. The oak trees dance and chimes jingle as the next rainstorm approaches. Due to the winds, unlike their usual flight pattern, planes fly over the house as they come in from the northeast. They fly southwest and then turn west to land at SFO. Plants perk up, welcoming the rain. The northern mockingbird takes a bath shaking his feathers in the bare ginkgo tree. The brown world becomes green again. The next poem is I wrote three years ago, but it applies to now. California burning 2017 to 2018. I am thinking back to October 9, 2017 around 4.30 a.m. in North Oakland. What smelled like someone barbecuing or burning wood was a Tubbs fire igniting Santa Rosa, Napa, and Lake Counties. Caused by eucalyptus and Australian import, when when fell into a pg e power line, it fulfilled their fire bombing menace. Friends of mine had to evacuate with their 14 month old and a second on the way. Another only had time to grab her dog and put him in the back of her pickup truck. Smoke followed me to my classroom at Berkeley City College. A Kaiser Permanente patients visiting internal medicine wore masks. They did so in the lab as well. At the end of the day, I walked with my neighbor and her border collie Australian Shepherd mix dog in the landmark Mountain View Cemetery. In spite of the sun's brilliant red, San Francisco is barely visible in the distance from the haze. She is a restaurateur whose employee planned her to send her to replenish Sonoma winery stock. She was not sure the trip ha was, would happen. Later on, she reported that some of her co-workers lost everything in the tub's fire. I think about how that hot, dry October of 2017 was not like October of 2016 when early rains kept fires away. As each fire was discovered, it was named to aid the firefighters planning logistics. The Lyons, Hot Creek County, Owens, and Donald fires were amongst the 58 fires named in 2018 breaking records for burning the most acreage in California history. Two combined into one named the River and Ranch Fires became the state's largest ever recorded. It burned for 54 days, forcing tens of thousands to leave their homes. The choir, fire acquired consciousness when it created its own wind. Much of Yosemite National Park was closed due to the Ferguson fire sending vacationers to Mammoth Lake, Sequoia, and Kings Canyon National Parks instead. 
We lost some of the thousand year old wonders, the giant sequoias at Mariposa Grove that I walked amongst in 2012. Fire warnings to even reach, reach the Lake Tahoe area. The car fire in Shasta County caused by a car failure was de the second deadliest of 2018. My middle school teacher who lives in Reading reported on Facebook that she was okay, although smoke surrounded her. The news report said it was 113 degrees and there's no humidity. People's eyes burned from the haze, their nose bled and they coughed. Asthma condition worsened. Even cats were not immune. Cars were just in ash. With, when smoky air reached the Bay Area, people chose daily walks around the Bay Trails because air quality seemed better than in the hills. Governor Jerry Brown called this the new normal. Trump tweeted that this water could be used to fight the fires is foolishly being diverted into the Pacific Ocean. Was he suggesting that waters run from the ocean to the mountains? The campfire of 2018 destroyed paradise, the town Trump called pleasure. In Pute County alone, 86 people have been reported as dead and there are still three unaccounted for. A norovirus outbreak hits shelters, sickening 145 people and people slept in their cars out in the cold. The air quality was so bad in the Bay Area that we were told to stay indoors. Schools were closed, cable cars were shut down, and people scrambled to find masks at local and drug hardware stores. We had the worst air pollution raking on earth, surpassing Delhi, Beijing, Istanbul, Moscow, Buenos Aires, Paris, and Los Angeles. This went on for almost two weeks. We finally got relief from the rain. Will smoke days become the West's new snow days? When an early morning dagger of light cuts through my curtains, I think I would have wanted to save in case I have to evacuate. The next poem I'm gonna read, I wrote since Calafia Burning was published. It's called All My Life. All my life, I want to be an architect, designing domes as elaborate as St. Peter's Basilica in Vatican City. I see myself with blueprints everywhere of a dome that is so huge that buttresses need to be placed around it to support its weight. I see myself as a serious person wearing a blouse, slacks, and flats the staff surrounding me looking at my plans, discussing what my brother couldn't afford. My patrons are no de Medici's. We have no insurance. We hope no one falls from the scaffolding. Like a trapeze artist who's, who misses the grip of their partner, I put on my t-shirt, jeans, and sneakers, and I'm off to the circus. All my life, I wanted to join the circus swinging above the audience on a trapeze in a gold sequin leotard as they stare up at me from the pitch black. A spotlight follows my every move. I can swing from my knees with my arms dangling below me and then reach out to my partner so we can swing together. I fall and injure myself. I go to the castle to recuperate. All my life, I want to live in a castle, dining a great hall with a cobblestone floors and art supports. On warm days, I can hang out in the front yard where a stone wall overlooks the Mediterranean Sea, watching ships come into the port. My dog and cat surround me as I stream shows on my iPad. I grab my swimsuit, hat, sunglasses, towel, and jelly sandals and head towards the sea. All my life, I want to live under the sea, living in what was once a Roman city named Baia with villas and hot springs that were patronized by Julius Caesar, Nero, and Cicero before malaria wiped out the city and the volcano sunk it into the sea in the 16th century. All my life, I wanted to be a sculptor in the ruins of Baia, staring back as a tourist take pictures of me as a snorkel, scuba dive, excuse me, scuba dive, or float past me from glass bottom boats like they do when they visit museums all over the world. 
okay, the last poem I wrote, I wrote a few weeks ago, it's called The Virus in the Storm. August 21st, 2021, it was supposed to be a homecoming concert for New York City. 60,000 people crowded Central Park to celebrate New Year's cities after a year and a half of COVID-19 shutdowns, a return to normal cultural life. Barry Manilow began to sing his 1980 song, I Made It Through the Rain. We dreamers have our ways of facing rainy days and somehow we survive. We keep the feeling warm, protect them from the storm until our time arrives. The Delta variant said to Hurricane Henry, I just finished my all you can eat buffet. Now it's your turn. Hurricane Henri said, yeah, I've heard enough of this singing. Let's shut this thing down. Four to five inches of rain began to flood Central Park and people got soaking wet as they ran screaming to get out of the rain. The concert never resumed. Thank you. Tennessee, thank you. Oh, and you'll be back to have a, a discussion with Linda and Frank at the end. So I really appreciate this. This has just been wonderful. Thank you. Um, our next guest, whoops. Can you hear me? Can you hear? Okay, good. Um, sorry, technical problems abound. Um, our next guest is Franklin Jella. Uh, as many of you know, he has won four Tony Awards, two for Best Leading Actor in a Play for his performance as Richard Nixon in Peter Morgan's Frost Nixon, and as Andre in Florian Zeller's The Father, and two for Best Featured Actor in a Play for his performances in Edward Albee's Seascape and Ivan Turgenev's Fortune's Fools. His, rep his reprisal of Nixon in the role of film production of Frost Nixon earned him an Academy Award nomination for Best Actor. Now, I know him also from having read this book, which is Drop Names, and it is a delight and juicy to read. But that's not what Frank's reading tonight. He's going to read from Without a Brother. And so let me bring Frank onto the screen. Let me unmic you. Let's toggle this mic. I can't. Can you hear me, Frank? I cannot hear you. So I am. Go to the top of your screen and where the microphone. Take your cursor to the top of the screen and you'll see a little microphone that you need to click and just hover over the top. I can't untoggle you. Is your friend there still with you? All you need to do is take the cursor to the top and you'll see a little microphone that has an X through it and you click it and it un it should work. If not, call me and I'll run your phone line right through my speaker right here. Because I am not hearing you. Yep, I see your lips moving, but I do not hear you. I'm sorry. Call me and, and we'll just find a back door in on this one. Any luck? I need to hear your voice, though, because it's so wonderful. So, well, let's try it with the telephone. Call on the telephone and I will put the phone to the speaker. We'll go from there. I have a feeling that what's happening is Frank is signing back in. There you are. So call on the telephone. We'll work on, we'll work it out that way. It's not ideal, but it's the best we got. Because I would hate to miss and then be sure to plug into the phone. Yep. We've got plenty of time. It's 
been that kind of day. I was telling somebody else that it was a no stop sign Tuesday or Monday in Bethel because no one stopped at a stop sign. So once in a while, things just get a little rocky. Yeah, I don't hear. I, there's no, there is no sound. So if you'd like to put it on the telephone and call my number again, we can do it that way. Call me. Call me. Yep. Susie, you're so right. All right, here goes. I'm going to let you plug into your telephone and then I'm going to put the speaker right next to you so that we can hear you there and I'm going to go away and let you read, Frank.
Thank you. Thanks, Frank. Well, folks, um, we were having terrible problems trying to get Frank on. It was, he's going to try and, and reschedule soon. We just couldn't get it working. He signed in several times. His headphones were, were problematic. So I think what I'm going to do is bring Linda and Tennessee on, and we will continue the discussion between the two of them so that they can chat about poetry in general and, and writing and so forth. And then I'll come back and please ask questions in the question tab at the bottom. And uh, yeah, I heard it is, it was a mess. And anyway, um, please ask questions and we will um, come back at the end. Thank you. Are we on? Yes, you yes, are. Yes, we are. Was it not possible for him to telephone you and have us put on speakerphone? I asked him that several times, and it just wasn't something that made him very happy. He wanted it to be perfect, and I don't blame him. He really, he really wanted it. I mean, I had it all. I had him on phone. I unmuted. I did everything, but it just wasn't. It okay. just. Sorry about that. Okay. It was his technology that wasn't working, and we did everything on our end to help, including tech support. So now we're going to get back to some writing. Okay. Well, Tennessee, I do have a question for you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. I, I was interested that most of the reading was about the fires and the smoke and the heat, but you started your reading with a poem about the rain, and I wondered if that was a conscious decision to get us from from the rain to the drought and and um have the contrast really in our heads it was somewhat i i don't think i really thought of it as coincidence but it <laughs> was uh, that was written in 2015 the one about rain and we were in a drought and then we had two years where we were doing well with rain and then we went back to a another severe drought. It's about as bad as when I was, was born, the year I was born in 77. So we're all having to ration water and we, have, and we don't get any rain till Thanksgiving now, if we do get it. Right. Well, a sort of related question is that um, obviously all of us Many of us think that all of this severe weather is due to global warming. And I wondered if you had a, a political agenda in your mind when you chose those subjects um, or whether they just, it just the reader could do that for, for him or herself. Well, I, I, I think I was trying to be political about it as, as uh, cause I put Jerry Brown's quote, the new normal. Right. Yes. Okay. And um, do you have any other questions that I have some to ask you? Well, I, I have a very personal question that you may not feel comfortable answering and I'm giving you permission to just say you don't want to deal with it. But okay. um, I'm a writer clearly and my daughter is a writer. She's a novelist. Her fourth novel just came out and I'm hoping that she's going to be on this program one day soon. But I know that there were times that it, we had, I haven't really discussed this with her a lot, but that there were times that it was hard being a writer when one of your parents was a writer too. And I know that, that you're the child of a writer and I wondered if there were benefits and, and hardships because of that, because it's a subject that really interests me. Yes, there there is. I think it's gotten better now that I'm older. But when I was a child, teen, and in my young as a young woman, it it was harder. It in some ways, at least the name Reed is enough 
you know, it, it's not necessarily you immediately think of a writer passed in a, such an unusual name that when my poor daughter would say that she was Rachel Paston, she would get asked, um, are you related to Linda Paston? I don't, when, when she was very young, I don't think she liked that very much. Now she's, you know, all grown up, I think, that she takes it in her stride. But I, I, it is something I think about. I remember... They haven't asked me this question in 10 years, but people would ask me who would thought I was a better writer, myself or my father. And <laughs> a silly question because we're different styles. And that's not what I would say to them. I, I, I'm amazed that any of you actually ask you that. Yes, I know. it was pretty common. Um, yeah, well, at least um, in the case of me and my daughter, I'm a poet and she's a novelist. So we, we right. have... We, we we help each other. I mean, she's one of my first readers and I read her stuff, but the, and, and I've, I've been asked if I feel competitive with her. And I don't think the people that ask that have children because I, I just can't imagine feeling competitive with, with one of my children because I think I feel that any of their accomplishments are my accomplishments too. So, um, I, I really enjoyed having a writer. Yes, um, my my husband is is a scientist, and one of our children is also a scientist. And then the third one is a chef, which is half science and half art. So we're the right. perfect genetic um, thing. So I I read your book about insomnia, which is unfortunately very common, but. Um, I really liked your poem about the MRI, which is something, unfortunately, I have too much experience with. But I liked how you uh, compared it to a spaceship. And also, uh, you talked about the various sounds that, that it makes. And I was wondering, were you, were you having, because I get terrified because I don't like tight spaces, if you had any fear when you were in the machine, like what you felt? I I expected to feel very claustrophobic um, and mostly I was worried about what they might find. But the actual experience of it, while I was there, I, I wrote this poem in my head, which enabled me not to think about what was going on. Oh, and wow. I, I find that, that I can do that often. I, I have a poem called At the Gynecologist, which I wrote while on the table in the gynecologist's office and um, a root canal poem that I wrote in my head while I was having a root canal. It's a, a wonderful way of separating yourself from a terrible experience if you can yes. think about how it could be a poem. That's what I'm doing with my back actually because I'm writing a series of poems because I just had a spinal fusion a few months ago and that's pretty terrifying surgery. Yeah. So I'm writing a poem about my diagnosis in 2006, and it will end with the year anniversary of the surgery. Right. That, that's yes. one of the benefits of, of being a poet. There aren't a lot of benefits, but one is being able to use um, difficult things and, and make something out of them. Right, which is one thing I've done all my life. Have you done that throughout your career as well? Yeah, I, I think so. And I started writing when I was about 12. I, oh, wow. I started writing poems about death when I was 12. I, I had no idea why. And now that I'm, I'm so much closer to it, I don't write about it as often. Um, I really liked your poems about birds, too, because that's something I've been interested in with in the last 15 years. Yeah. Well, we the used to live... Speaks. We used to live in the woods and um, there were birds everywhere and we had feeders everywhere and I could sit at the window and I could see them at the feeder, but they couldn't see me. And, and that was quite wonderful. Um, yes. And my husband is a real birder with, you know, he, oh, wow. he really cares about what they're called and what they do. I just like looking at them. I'm like a cross between, I have some books about birds in the Bay Area on my bookshelf. And also, I like your travel poems, like Italy, for instance. Thank you. I, 
did a lot of traveling once and it's been very hard these last couple of years being right. confined to an apartment. I don't think I've gone any place for, you know, since the pandemic began. And when I look back at the poems, I mean, we used to go to Italy every year. Oh, wow. um, my husband was on a, uh, the board of a medical school there. So we, we had a free trip and I, I loved it. And um, I'm just hoping <laughs> that I won't be too old to travel when this pandemic is over. Um, well, I'm actually taking my first trip since the pandemic on Saturday, but not internationally. Where are you going? Lenox Center for the Arts for a three week artist residency. Oh, wow. That's exciting. Yes. Yeah. I've, I've never done one of those um, yes. residencies. I've always been afraid that if I did it, I would feel obligated to write something and I wouldn't be able to just because I was supposed to. So I, I, I've never tried that. Well, I did uh, it, uh, 19 years ago, but I think now that I'm 44 and not 25, I think I'll be better able to handle it. Yeah. Just having like more maturity. Yeah, I wouldn't have guessed you were 44. I would have thought I, you were I'll much be younger. I'll 45 in February. Well, <laughs> it sounds very young to me. I'll be 90 in May. Oh, so, wow. Um, no, I've decided numbers don't mean anything. Right. But yes. Um, what else? Trying to think. I can help okay. with that. We have some okay. questions for both of you. Okay. Um, one of the questions that came up is, and I think Tennessee addressed some of this, but do you find that the events over the last year especially have influenced your writing today? And you did, both of you uh, touched on it. But one of the questions is which events and specifically and why? And if you feel you've already answered it, I can go on to another question if you like. I don't think I've written anything about the pandemic particularly. Um, so I, I don't think specific events have really influenced my work, but just whatever is happening in the world just comes in and, and gets into your unconscious and comes out in the poems, like the, my rainy country poem. Mm -hmm. um, things, when I wrote that, we things weren't as bad as they've been the past few years. They were bad. They're always pretty bad someplace, if you really read your newspaper. Yeah. Tennessee? Um, well, my back poem, oh. I talk a lot about COVID because I had the, the uh, bad news at the end of 2020 during the Thanksgiving surge and I would have to have surgery and they got to that point. So um, I, I had to, um, you know, get the MRI and have an x-rays all, all through that time. In the middle of it. Right. And then I consulted with the surgeon at the beginning of the new year. And we didn't know what the date was yet because the co because he this everything was pushed back in terms of surgery because he had to reschedule all his December and January patients, but it came quicker than I thought. And then the pro the complications of my parents not being able to be with me in the hospital, and I wasn't vaccinated, and I didn't want to stay in the hospital because I wasn't able to get vaccinated yet at that time. My age group wasn't qual wasn't um wasn't available the shots yet i did get them eventually mm -hmm. but i talk about all those complications wow um on a lighter note yes what is on your to be read list i want to know what you're reading well in terms of poetry i'm i'm always reading it you know old favorites, new new people. Um, but mostly I am a reader, a compulsive reader of fiction. And um, I must read a novel a week. And oh my. that's kept, well, you, you have a bookstore. I, I, I know, but I'm so envious. I wish I could right. read a novel a week. <laughs> right. Um, that's the only thing that's really gotten me through these two years of confinement. 
Um, I haven't written as much as I usually do, but mm. I've read a lot and, and that's, that's been very helpful. I love contemporary fiction. Um, I particularly love contemporary women's fiction, I have to say, I, but um, yeah. How about you? Tennessee, what are you reading? Tennessee. I've been reading a lot this summer. I discovered the Kindle app on my iPad. <gasps> so I read Frank Langella's book and I read Linda Paston's Insomnia and I read several political books and poetry books and novels. And also I have my a book that my parents edited called Big Country on, Bob, on Broadway. It just came out, talks about all the racial stereotypes in Hollywood movies from different uh, writers from of different ethnic backgrounds. Oh, cool. So I have that re ready for me. And also I'm reading about Jean-Michel Basquiat from his, his girlfriend who's still alive. Oh. Wrote about him. Do you, um, do you feel that there's an author that you've read and it doesn't matter whether it's recent or not, that is completely overlooked that you feel shouldn't be? Oh, lots of them. Yeah, um, I, I know, but I'd love to yeah. know about them and it, as part of the discussion too. <laughs> well, a poet that I think has really been overlooked who I think is just incredible, his name is Roland Flint. And um, he was a Washington poet. He died a number of years ago. And um, his, his poetry is absolutely fantastic and, and people just don't know about it. Um, I have poet friends in Washington, D.C., um, Jean Nordhaus, Myra Sklaru, who should be better known and read more than they are. Um, sometimes I, I think it's so arbitrary who gets published and who gets read. Um, some of the people I know who can't get their books published that are so much better than what I see in the bookstores that, that I, I don't know what the secret is. Um, but there are lots of wonderful writers out there that, that people don't know about. Tennessee? And that's what, what Penn Oakland and Conch are all about. A Conch has been around for 30 years, first in print and now it's online. And I publish it every quarter. It's We're trying to publish authors that wouldn't be published otherwise and get them out there in the world for people to see. And Penn Oakland, we try to nominate authors that aren't well known. So, so they can be on the national stage too. That's a service. Yes. That's a real service. Um, do you have a link that you can put in the chat? I can. Yes, let please. Me put the con let me put the con. I just published it yesterday. By all means, put it in the chat. And the um, there's another one other question that I really want to ask is, and this this is a little off. Well, anyway, I'll just ask it. What book have you read that you wish you had written? The collected poems of Keats. <laughs> I wish I had ah. written that. Keats. Uh, Keats. Yeah. Yeah. And he was so young. Tennessee? I've actually never really thought about that. I know. It's a really interesting question. Someone someone posed it, and I thought it was a really good question. There's some writers on Conch who I think are really good. And um, now some of them are much younger than me. And I wish I could have written like that at that time, too. The wonderful thing is that that when you real read really great poetry or wonderful poems written now that you come across, one doesn't feel envy. One just feels grateful that that they're there for you to read, um, and and they can be the classics like like Keats and and Yeats that I always go back to, or just something that you pick up in a magazine some have never heard of. Um, well, I, I always I, go ahead. I was just going to say, I never feel jealous. I, I just feel grateful that they're there, and it makes me want to. It makes me want to go to my desk and write. 
when I read something really good. Well, you ought, you both ought to know that as little a store as we are, our largest events are poetry nights. We have poem, poets from all over the state of Connecticut that come here and read poetry. And when we, in the before times, we used to have them regularly and we really are looking forward to getting it back to, back to it. But the advantage to Crowdcast, other than the technical problems that we had tonight, is to have Tennessee enjoy, enjoy being with us tonight from across the across the uh, United States. So that's been a real treat for all of us. Um, I think that's about all the time that we have tonight, unless I haven't seen um, any other question come up. Is there anything else that you would like to, con to mention to us or... I just, just to so thank Roger for doing this program. I mean, I have something Roger. to look forward to every Monday, which is great. I really very much appreciate Roger asking us. And, you know, it was a little bit of a rocky start tonight, but we'll make up for it in the long run. Um, we're always sad to see an independent bookstore leave us, and we're sorry to see book review close. But I am very grateful to be the new host of Write America because the program just is an opportunity to hear your work. Both of you ladies, it was just wonderful evening. So thank you. let me, let me just say thank you to both of you. Um, just a reminder that this, this event has been recorded. And so you may come back and watch it. My mic just went away. Nope, it didn't. Um, you may come back and watch it at any time or send it to your friends. I am very grateful to both our artists tonight, uh, Tennessee Reed and Linda Paston, for their time and sharing such wonderful work with us. Um, I'm Alice Hutchinson from Birds Books. On behalf of Write America, uh, thank Roger Rosenblatt for putting such a great program together. And we will see you next time when we have... Um, Emma Walton Hamilton and Wilma Woolitzer uh, next Monday at seven o'clock. Thank you very much.